Authorization is the step that happens after authentication once someone is logging in into our system. So once the login request is approved, which means that the system now knows who the user is, the next step is deciding what they can do, which is the step of authorization. It needs to check what resources or actions that user has permissions to access and also what are the denied actions for this user. This is how we control security and privacy in the systems and in this video you'll learn how applications and systems manage permissions using the three main authorization models. The first one is role-based access control. Next we have attribute-based access control. Also access control list which is another way of managing authorization. Plus, you'll learn how technologies like OAuth2 and GVTs help us to enforce those rules in practice. So authentication happens first, which tells us who the user is and if they are allowed to access our system. But on the next step we have authorization, which determines what you can actually do as a user in this system. If we take a look at GitHub as an example and accessing repositories on GitHub, there you have different permissions for different users. For example, user A can have write access only, which means they can only push code to this repo. But on the other hand, we can have user B, and here you can grant only read access, which means they can only read this repository, but they cannot push code to it, or they cannot create pull requests, and so on. And on the other side, we can have also admin users, which have full control, so they can manage all the settings for the repository, they can even decide to delete this repository, and so on. So you can see that different users can have different access controls on systems. To manage these access controls, we have common authorization models. So the one that we just looked at is the role-based authentication model, which assigns roles to users, something like admin, editor, or read-only access, write-only access. And this is the most common approach among these authorization models. But we also have attribute-based access control, which is based on the user or resource attributes. So this is more flexible and more complex compared to the role-based authentication. And the other common approach is to have access control lists, ACL, and each resource here has its own permissions list. So you can assign permission lists to a resource, and this is what will determine what resources you can access. For example, this is a common way of managing Google Docs, and we will look at this in more detail now. And each of these models has its trade-offs, pros and cons. So this depends on the specific system requirements, but real systems often combine also multiple models together to have more complex and more secure setup. So first up we have role-based access control or RBAC as an acronym. Here users are assigned to roles and each role has a defined set of permissions. For example, as you saw with the GitHub, you can have admins and admins usually have full access to all resources. So they can create, they can read or update resources, they can even delete resources and also manage other users in the roles. And next you have editor, which is usually a bit less than admin, so they can edit content like creating or reading content or updating resources, but they cannot delete resources and they cannot also manage other users. And next you can have viewer users, which can only read data, so they can read the resources and content, but they cannot update anything or they cannot create anything in your system. This is the most common way in authorization models, and this is used in apps that you use daily, like you saw with GitHub or Stride dashboards or CMS tools, team management tools, and so on. The next model is attribute-based access control, or ABAC in short. This access control goes beyond the roles, so it uses the user attributes or resource attributes and environment conditions to define the access. Some example policy you can see here, so let's say you want to only allow access if some conditions are met. In this case, whenever the user department is set to HR, and you can combine this with multiple conditions, like whenever the resource attribute equals to internal, and so on, and only in this case you allow them access, and you either allow them read access or write access, so this can also be combined with the role-based authorization. But in this case, you are checking the user model or resource model in your database and based on the attributes, you either allow or deny the access. So here, as you can see, we are checking user attributes like the department, the age or whatever you want to check here. 
Next, you can also combine it with resource attributes like confidentiality or the owner of the resource or classification. And this can also be combined with environment like time of the day, location, device type, and so on. Since you're combining these attributes to either grant or restrict access, this is more flexible than the role-based authorization, but it requires good policy management. And generally, it's more complex and you can encounter conflicts here with the attribute-based access control. The third common type is the access control lists. Instead of providing role-based access or attribute-based access, you can have access control list for the specific resource. Let's say you have a resource like a document or a JSON file, and here you can have a permission list on which users can access this document. Like user Alice has only read access, or user Bob has both read and write access, and another user has no access to this document. So as you can see, we're managing two things here. First of all, which users are allowed to access this document? And second, what are their permissions? So each of the users has different permissions on this document. ACLs are highly specific and also user-centric, which means it's hard to scale them well in systems with millions of users or objects, unless you manage them carefully. But for example, Google Drive is one example of this, where you have documents like a Google Doc, and then you share this Google Doc with your colleagues, right? So you share someone with read access only, and then you share this doc with someone else, but now they can also edit and add comments to this document. So this is a example of ACL access control list, which is used in Google Drive and Google Documents. This gives you more control over resources and documents, but it's also harder to scale with millions of users. But it's possible, as you can see, because Google Drive is using this for their documents, Excel sheets, and so on. If you'd like to learn how to build this into a real-world application and not just hear it in Fury, then the first link in the description is my mentorship program where you will learn how to apply these concepts in production-level systems and also implement it hands-on and work closely with me. It will be the first link in the description. So these were the access control models, but how do systems enforce those authorizations? These are where OAuth2 and GVT or access tokens come into play. So first we have OAuth2, which is delegated authorization, which is a protocol used when service wants to access another service's resources on behalf of a user. For example, if you want to let a third-party app read your GitHub repositories, let's say you're deploying your app to Vercel, so you need to give Vercel control over your repository on GitHub. Instead of giving your username and password to the third-party application, which won't be secure at all because you don't know what they can do with your username and password, this way you are giving them full control. Instead, GitHub gives them the token that represents the permissions which you approved to use. So you as a user send a request with the third party app to request access to your repositories. And then GitHub gives you the access token which you should create. So you should also provide what resources, what repositories this third party app can access and also what they can do. Can they create, read, update or can they delete or whatever the permissions you set and then GitHub sends them the token which contains the permissions which this third-party app is allowed to use. And OAuth2 defines the flow for securely issuing and validating those tokens. So you give them the access token and not your password which represents the permissions that you approved personally. So it can be reading specific repos or also creating pushing to those repositories but not deleting those repositories. And next we have also token-based authorization using GVT or bearer tokens and permission logic. Once a user is authenticated, most systems use a token, typically a GVT token or this can be also bearer token, that carries this information like user ID, the roles like admin or editor, and also scopes, which is what scopes they are allowed to access and whenever this token is expiring and who is the issuer of this token. So whenever a user makes a request, it always carries this token information and reaches to the backend server. This is where the server will check your token and validity and it will apply the appropriate permission logic. 
So to not confuse this with authorization models, there is a key distinction. The token usually carries the identity and claims of your user, as you see it here. But authorization models like role-based or attribute-based, this is what defines what is allowed to access as a user. So tokens are just mechanisms, while these are authorization models. So in summary, authorization isn't just letting users in, like authentication, but it also controls what they can access once they are in. We learned what authorization is, what are the three most common authorization models, which are role-based, attribute-based, and access control lists. And also you saw a couple of real-world examples, like how GitHub manages your authorization tokens. And this should give you an idea on when to use each model based on the system that you're building. And you also saw some implementation patterns with OAuth2 or GBT tokens. Each of these models has their own trade-offs, their own pros and cons, and real systems often combine multiple models to stay flexible and secure.